So, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrea Vinante, and I, uh, I will give a lecture on, from Trento in Italy. I will give lectures on um, a mechanical resonator, um, but um, I will try to um, differentiate a bit my presentation with respect to previous ones. Uh, I will mostly focus on um, experiments, timing and detecting uh, weak forces and small displacement. So precision measurement uh, in sense. Uh, this experiment, uh, the experiment I will consider uh, are essentially classical in the sense that they, they are not designed to, to, to measure uh, quantum effect whatsoever. Uh, but uh, um, it turns out, so the connection to the, the topic of the school is the, what, as you have already seen in uh, previous uh, talks, that it, um, it's possible to test uh, collapse models um, using so-called non-interferometric methods, which is essentially uh, based on the fact that uh, if you have a, a collapse of the wave function, uh, then it does not only uh, collapse the superposition, the superposition state, but it also affects, um, also induces a shaking of any mechanical object, so it induces a force noise, and so you can try to measure this effect by just by uh, means of very high precision measurement on uh, mechanical systems. So uh, the outline uh, will be, uh, today I will talk, will be a mostly a lecture about general feature of these experiments. Um, as most of these experiments are essentially limited by um, thermal noise, basically uh, measuring weak forces is to a good extent is like uh, um, is the art of fighting the thermal noise in, in mechanical systems. And uh, uh, tomorrow I will mostly go in the, I will more go into the details of some recent experiments. So this, is most, this will be an ex a presentation of a recent experiment that we have used to uh, set significant limit of, on collapse model, which are actually in nowadays the, um, the strongest the limits in least in some parameter space. Uh, so today uh, I will just be uh, more general. Um, I hope the uh, lecture will not become too boring. In that case, just tell me, and I will just keep jump to the second part. Okay, so uh, I will also start with a uh, bit of history. Um, basically, everything started from here. Um, this is probably the first experiment uh, uh, that has been done to measure uh, using mechanical resonator to measure some unknown force. And uh, I don't know if anybody of you has ever performed this experiment, this Cavendish experiment. I, uh, when I was undergraduate students, I, I did this in, uh, in some laboratory course. It, it was one of the worst experiments ever. It was incredibly uh, slow and boring, but uh, uh, well, it's really a remarkable experiment because it, was done like 200 and more than 200 years ago. And uh, even today, if you want to measure the gravitational uh, constant Z, basically the best method you have is this. So technology is improved, but the concept is more or less the same. Okay, but I will, um, the experiment I will talk, uh, especially tomorrow, are more related with something which is more modern. Um, in particular, we talk about country cantilever experiments, nanomechanical resonators, which uh, are used uh, uh, in this case to measure uh, spins in, uh, uh, in the spins or ensemble of spins in, in the measured matter samples. And uh, um, I will also discuss uh, um, gravitational wave detectors, which are basically very conceptually very similar, very uh, simple mechanical systems, uh, which are used to detect uh, uh, fluctuation in the space-time matrix, traditional waves. Um, so what other forces can one measure with a mechanical system? Well, there is a very long list. If I give it just a very partial list, uh, you can measure gravitational forces, gravitational waves. Uh, uh, there are people looking at uh, low distance uh, deviations, uh, short distance deviation of the Newton law, due, for instance, to theories predicting Hidden dimensions or something like that, or uh, uh, even some uh, new particles that have been uh, 
proposed to solve some problem in high energy physics could actually be probed by mechanical experiments. Uh, Casimir forces, uh, even radiation pressure forces in optomechanics are also some kind of fundamental physics uh, mechanical uh, effect. But you have also uh, plenty of application in the mechanical resonator. The most important probably is atomic force microscopy, which is a, a new technology which is used to, to, sum, to, to image uh, uh, the surface of a sample with atomic resolution. And then you have also all the application of MEMS, uh, which are relatively easy. Uh, but anything that you can transduce to a force on a mechanical resistor, resonator can be measured uh, by these methods. So, um, by the general scheme of a, uh, for a measurement of a, a force is, uh, well, essentially it's very simple. It's just a mechanical oscillator. Uh, an harmonic uh, oscillator with the mass and the spin constant. In general, you have also dissipation, uh, a damping factor, gamma. And then you have uh, several possible forces that can affect your system. Uh, uh, one is the signal, it's the one you are looking for, uh, which most of the case uh, uh, does not exist, uh, but uh, you are looking for. And then you have some other uh, forces that you uh, want to reduce as much as possible. You have a thermal noise, which is uh, related at least to the dissipation of the, uh, the system. Uh, you, you have uh, some, any other kind of uh, technical excess noise, uh, which can come, for instance, from vibration in the systems or coming from the external world or seismic noise or whatever. Use uh, excess noise in principle. If you are a good experimentalist, you can suppress uh, as much as you want. Uh, it's not a fundamental uh, anything fundamental. And then you have uh, the, the, the fundamental building block of any measurement is of course the measurement device, which uh, has, um, to an avoidable effect, it adds some some noise on the measurement, so uh, some artificial noise, uh, and uh, it also uh, generates a back action force. The best you can do, as we'll see, is uh, that uh, uh, these two uh, these two effects are um, bounded just by the quantum by the quantum uh, uh, the Heisenberg limit. So quantum mechanics imposes a fundamental limit on this uh, uh, on the product of these two uh, effects. But in general case, this is uh, 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 this is just the best case. In general, uh, the noise will be much higher. Quantum noise. Um, so, the, um, from the mathematical point of view, the, this is a very straightforward system. It's just a harmonic oscillator with a, a driving force. And in the frequency domain, you will just define a mechanical susceptibility, which is the, how much the, uh, the system will respond to an external driving force in terms of displacement, because we measure the displacement. And the input is a force. So that's very uh, simple. Um, so now I will consider the, what are the most fundamental uh, limitations to uh, the measurement of force. And the most uh, uh, annoying problem, which is the most fundamental, so the, is the thermal noise. Uh, thermal noise can be uh, described very well by the um, surface dissipation theory. I guess you know, uh, uh, basically it say, states that um, whenever you have a system which is coupled to a thermal bus, uh, and it can be described by a linear uh, response, that if you drive the system, the response is uh, linear, there is some linear susceptibility, then uh, you can, um, uh, and this system is coupled to a thermal bus, given temperature T, then there is a relation between surface and dissipation. Dissipation is how much the rate is, uh, uh, of uh, which energy is dissipated in the thermal bath when you drive the system. And is represented by the imaginary part of the susceptibility in the frequency domain. So basically, uh, if you drive a system and uh, the response is out of phase with respect to the driving, then you have dissipation. You can take this as, as, as a, a definition. And uh, um, 
the fluctuation, so the noise is what happens when the system isn't driven. So you have the interaction with the thermal bus that gives rise to uh, noise, uh, and which you can describe uh, with the spectral density of the fluctuations, and the position, and the cost. And this is given by these relations, uh, which uh, in, uh, um, in the classical limit, if you are, uh, um, it is uh, the most typical situation in mechanical experiments because in mechanical experiments we work typically at very low frequency. Um, if you are in the class, if you are close to the quantum uh, um, um, level, then uh, you, you need to replace the KT with the, the quantum expression uh, of this one. But in, uh, okay, in the rest of the uh, talk, I will mostly use the classical. Okay, uh, we can do many examples. The, 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 power of, the power of the fluctuation dissipation theorem is that it is very general. And uh, well, we are mostly interested in the uh, mechanical case in which you have uh, a, uh, that the force noise is related to the damping factor uh, uh, the system, but uh, you can apply the flotation dissipation theorem in any kind of system which shows linear response. So just to make an example, take a piece of magnetic material and uh, uh, you ask uh, how many, how, how large are the fluctuations in the magnetization of the system. Uh, the only thing you have to do is uh, to measure the susceptibility, to apply an external magnetic field measure the response and then apply the formula. And then you get the, uh, uh, how much, how large is the fluctuation in the magnetic. Uh, and you can apply this to any kind of uh, uh, system which shows linear response. Um, another example is the electrical, uh, the Nyquist formula, which is actually, the, historically this was the first fluctuation dissipation formula that was um, derived. Is that the, the voltage noise across the resistor is for KT R. Okay, so um, I go now a bit out of track. Um, this is, uh, I want to tell you about the, an application, possible application of the fluctuation dissipation in a context which is different from the mechanical uh, one. And this is thermometry. Uh, thermometry is uh, uh, one of the nightmares of. Uh, uh, Experimentalist working especially uh, in uh, the low temperature, uh, low temperature experiments because it's very difficult to perform measurement of temperature and avoid uh, systematic errors because the, there are also some problems in the definition of temperature at very low temperature. And uh, um, um, so, uh, fluctuation dissipation uh, can be actually used as a primary thermometer. Which but it's related to a fundamental mechanism again. And uh, I show this, this is an example of noise thermometer that has been performed at uh, um, very low temperature in a, a remarkably large uh, temperature range. The, the thermometer is uh, just a piece of copper. You take a rod of copper, um, you wind a coil around it, and you send the current in the wire, then um, you have a dissipation uh, because you generate a magnetic field. An alternating magnetic field in a piece of metal generates dissipation because of eddy current. But now the fluctuation dissipation theorem states that if you have dissipation, you have also fluctuation. So uh, if you don't send any current anymore in, a, in, the, in, the, in the wire, uh, you will detect, in any case, some noise. This noise is due to some thermally induced, thermally generated currents inside the you don't know how they are actually uh, made, but what you know is that the spectral, the spectral density of the noise, which is picked up by the wire, will be related to the dissipation you have measured. And so you can use this to measure, you will actually measure this spectral density. So uh, in practice, you, have, uh, you connect the coil to a sensor of magnetic flux, which is called speed. I will describe the, uh, I'll describe tomorrow uh, speed is, uh, but for the moment just take it as a sensor of magnetic, uh, magnetic flux. And uh, um, so this is a measurement, and uh, you see that if you change the temperature of the system, the, the, the noise uh, are being done. What is 
remarkable in this measurement is that they have done this over an uh, incredibly large uh, temperature and the, the noise is linearly with temperature. And the temperature here is uh, uh, goes from one, about one Kelvin here down to 10 to minus five here in the micro Kelvin uh, region which is essentially is the lowest temperature you can achieve in uh, um, low temperature experiments for, let's say, except uh, uh, for cold atoms experiment, which you pull only uh, you know, a cloud of, atom, uh, of uh, uh, gas particles, but uh, the lowest temperature you, you can achieve with uh, um, cooling a piece of solid matter, a microscopic piece of solid matter, is something the order of uh, micro. Which noise? Yeah. This is thermal noise. This is just thermal noise. Uh, there is some uh, some. Uh, the frequency dependence because uh, uh, there is a cutoff due, due to geometrical parameters of the. Essentially, this, um, uh, this system can be roughly described as an RL circuit, in a sense. You have an inductance uh, in, the, in the readout circuit, in the coil, and this uh, uh, produces a cutoff. So you measure just the low frequency. Uh, uh, yeah, there is a band, finite bandwidth, as in any practical uh, system. So the, the, yeah. the response of the system as a bandwidth. Okay, I go back to uh, mechanics. So this is the typical situation uh, you have in a mechanical uh, uh, system, mechanical resonator, which I think it was already shown something similar yesterday. Uh, the force noise is essentially flat in a mechanical system it's related with the damping of the system. So the, you can also uh, describe it using the quality factor. But the displacement fluctuation uh, uh, feature, of course, the, uh, the response of the system, which is Lorentzian, uh, is the denominator of this uh, expression. And so the, what you see, in, if you measure the, spec, the spectrum of the system, is a, a, a Lorentzian uh, curve. The relative width of this curve is, one over, is proportional to one over Q, while the height is proportional to the Q uh, factor. So it turns out that the integral of this curve is independent of the quality factor. So if you reduce the dissipation, the driving force is lower, but uh, you have also lower, dis, um, um, uh, lower dissipation, so the system is driven to a larger amplitude. And these two effects compensate exactly. Uh, in order to uh, satisfy actually the uh, classical equal partition theorem. So the uh, mean energy of the system should just be uh, equal to uh, KT, half KT. Okay, um, this is actually not uh, completely true in a real uh, experiment. In, uh, in many situations you see something, uh, uh, okay, there is Um, uh, in a real situation, you can have a, a so-called cold damping. Cold damping is a situation with, um, in which the quality factor of the system is affected by the measurement system um, with what is called a cold mechanism. So it's not uh, um, a coupling to the thermal bus, but a coupling to something that doesn't add noise. Uh, you have typically two cases. One uh, is uh, optomechanical uh, damping. Um, this is the thing I think you have seen yesterday. If you couple mechanical system to optical cavity, you can have, under some um, well-defined uh, condition, you can have a cooling, which can exploit to achieve ground state cooling. But you can achieve a very similar situation by just by feedback. You measure very efficiently uh, the, the, the position of your system, and uh, you apply a force which is inversely proportional to the velocity. Um, 
then you, apply, you get something very similar to viscous force. The effect is uh, uh, to, uh, to slow down the motion of the system. And uh, in terms of the spectral response, um, what you see is that what you change is the quality factor in the denominator, so in the response of the system. But you are not changing uh, the numerator, which contains the, the, the force noise. So the coupling to the thermal bath is the same, but you are changing just the dynamical response of the system. This is a, um, actually an example of uh, um, experiment in which you apply feedback cooling uh, and uh, you reduce the, the quality factor of the system. In this way, you reduce the variance. Uh, variance is no more KT divided by the by K, so what you expect uh, from the heat partition, but uh, uh, you have a correction which is due to this uh, reduction in the quality factor. And in this way, you can uh, reduce the variance and is an effective cooling of the system, which is not a real cooling. It's just the cooling of that degree of freedom you are uh, cooling. But the coupling to the thermal bath is exactly the same. So uh, it's very important to know that whenever you have this situation, um, the force noise is the same. And uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio to the measurement of force is also unchanged, basically because you are changing just the response of the system. But if you think at a mechanical resonator as a, a system which has input uh, force and the output is the, the displacement, then you have just uh, that the, the force noise and the force signal have just the same, uh, um, they always see the same uh, uh, response function. So the ratio between the two is, uh, is the same. I don't know if it's clear, but uh, this is quite... Uh, Sometimes people uh, really don't get this point. It's quite uh, um, quite obvious. I mean, if it were possible to reduce the force noise just by changing the damping in this way, that would be uh, very easy to, to get uh, high sensitivity, but unfortunately, it's not the case. Okay, just uh, do an example of how uh, a measurement of force uh, looks in a real, uh, real life. This is an experiment uh, uh, which uh, is done using the cantilever, but it's just an example. It's just uh, um, an example from a paper from Jerko Osterkamp, who I think will be here next week. So I think he's happy if I show some uh, some of his uh, work. Uh, this is a cantilever which is measured uh, by a, a laser. So this oscillates back and forth, and you measure the position using this laser. So, and these are the thermal fluctuations of the position of this, uh, uh, of this mechanical system, which is exactly what you expect from the situation dissipation relation. On top of this uh, thermal noise, you see this small peak. This is a signal. The signal which is generated in this case by um, uh, by coupling to some spins, and you have nuclear spins on this uh, uh, the end of the cantilever. Here you have a, a magnetic, uh, a strong magnet, which generates a strong gradient here. So you have a force between the spins and the magnet. And if you apply RF pulses, like magnetic resonance, uh, using magnetic resonance technique, you can flip these uh, spins with the same, at the same frequency of the cantilever. You can set the frequency at which you want to you, 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 uh, uh, flip these spins. And this generates a modulation on this force. And uh, this force is here sees as a peak. Um, now, if you uh, go from position to force, and to do that, you have just to, to, to divide by the transfer function of the system, by the mechanical susceptibility, then you get this. And you see that, uh, well, the, the thermal noise should be flat, but you see the, the force is actually like this because you have the measurement noise also that plays a role when you go of resonance. And in the middle, you see the signal, which appears as a peak on, on top of a flat noise. Um, okay.
this one. Yeah, this is the experimental setup. It's, uh, uh, this is a cantilever. It's, uh, it oscillates back and forth. It's a mechanical motion, bending mode of the cantilever. And, uh, and this is the optical readout. And uh, yeah, the signal uh, is, so you have a force between this magnet, this is a magnet, um, which applies a, a strong magnetic field. Uh, and here you have spins. So you have just a magnetic dipole-dipole uh, force between uh, this strong magnet and these spins. So if you are able, and it's possible to do it by using the magnetic resonance technique to flip the, the spins, you are modulating, actually, you are uh, changing the sign of this force. And in this way, you can generate a signal which are which is macroscopic. The, it's not macroscopic, it can be measured. And actually, people uh, uh, with similar experiments have been able to detect a single spin, a single electron spin. Uh, the interaction between a macroscopic magnet and then between the, uh, the single spin, using a cantilever like this. Here you have nuclear spins, uh, which is, uh, the, the effect is much smaller. So we need, uh, actually, you see. A small number, but still like uh, hundreds or thousands of spins. Yeah, in this experiment, I think it's nuclear spins. Yeah. Well, because the frequency, the resonance, when you do magnetic resonance, uh, you, you, the, the frequency you are, um, the frequency at which spins uh, respond is completely different in the case of nuclear. So in case, uh, here you, are, they apply, you apply magnetic resonance protocols which are designed to, uh, to manipulate nuclear spins. Yeah, here you apply, you apply RF uh, fields, which are, well, the protocol is a bit complicated now to, to describe, but the frequency of these fields is uh, tuned to the, uh, around the, the magnetic resonance frequency, which depends on the magnetic moment of your spins. So if you want to manipulate electron spins, you, you need uh, like a uh, microwave frequency. If you want to manipulate nuclear spins, you, you use frequency in the megahertz. Uh, uh, it depends also on the magnetic field you have. Okay, now. Um, so I'll go back to the expression of the force noise uh, of the generic uh, mechanical resonator. And you see that if you want to reduce as much as possible the thermal noise, what you need is to reduce temperature as much as you can. This is uh, quite uh, obvious. You want to have high quality factor. Uh, so you want to decouple your system as much as you can from the thermal bath. And well, if you want also to reduce the absolute value of this, you want a light system, low mass, and low frequency. Low frequency is quite uh, important, but I will, turn, I will come back later on this. Um, actually, uh, what is uh, really important in the measurement is the signal to noise ratio. So that depends very much on also on the signal you are going to measure. And um, that's, um, I do some example now uh, to illustrate this problem. So I will show you two examples of mechanical resonator with a completely uh, opposite side in terms of uh, um, size. So this is a very small mechanical resonator made of a carbon nanotube. Uh, carbon nanotube uh, cooled to uh, zero temperature actually in this. In this experiment, they've measured a force noise which is order of 10 to minus 20 Newton per square root of time, which is an incredibly small number. Uh, but it's very much related to the fact that you have a very low mass uh, involved. Um, on the opposite side, I think this is the largest uh, kind of mechanical system that have been used in, uh, in, uh, to do some physics experiments. These are um, uh, resonant bar gravitational wave detectors, which is actually the, the previous generation of gravitational wave detectors before people uh, were able to operate LIGO and the similar interferometers. This was the simplest measure, uh, simple method to, to measure gravitational waves. And there's nothing else than mechanical, a big mechanical resonator uh, with a mass of uh, two tons in this case, uh, the two ton bar of aluminum. And the gravitational wave will, will just uh, uh, have 
this effect, it will change the distance between uh, the length of the, uh, of the bar, and in this way it will be equivalent to a force, uh, a volume force which has uh, excited this oscillation mode. And if you plug in the numbers of this experiment, you get that the force noise, this experiment is 10 to minus 12 newton per second squared, which is still quite low, but much uh, higher than, than this, of course. However, if you want to measure a gravitational effect, uh, uh, of course, this is much better because uh, the mass is here is 10 to the 3 kilogram. Here is 10 to minus 20. So it's the gravi gravity couples to the mass. So you have a single piece, which is more than 20 orders of magnitude larger. Um, okay, just for, uh, just for fun, I, okay, it's interesting to see. It's very simple to, con to calculate what the minimum amplitude of a gravitational wave that can be measured by this uh, system. It's quite uh, um, remarkable. So uh, gravitational wave is measured by amplitude H, which is basically you have two, point, uh, two points in space. Uh, H measures the relative change of distance induced by gravitational wave. Uh, applied the, if you apply this to, a, to a, this bar, uh, which has a length of uh, three meters, well, one meter is the order of magnitude here, but um, uh, the force, uh, the, this effect is equivalent to a force, uh, which is given by K delta L. Delta L is induced by gravitational wave. K is the spring constant of the, of the system. This can be uh, also written in this way. Um, if you compare the, this force uh, with uh, the force noise uh, we have calculated before, you can calculate what is the uh, gravitational wave, the equivalent gravitational wave you need, uh, the amplitude of gravitational wave you need to, to generate an effect comparable to the thermal noise. Uh, and you equate these two uh, expressions, and what you get is something uh, of the order of 10 to minus 22 per square root of Earth. Uh, this is pure number uh, divided per square root of Earth because uh, the strain is a, a pure number, uh, is a relative thing, okay, delta L over L. If you convert this into a length, it means that you are basically measuring this, um, you'll be able to measure the, 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 the fluctuation of this bar with the uh, uh, sensitivity in the order of 10 to minus 22 newtons. Is, uh, very, very so in general, if you have something that is very large and rigid, then you can measure very small absolute displacement. And this is the case for gravitational wave detectors. Uh, well, if you want to measure small absolute forces, like these very tiny forces that you have when you couple a spin to a uh, mechanical system, then you want uh, to have something very soft and uh, very light. It is quite intuitive, but uh, just to, uh, it's something quite uh, that comes out from. Uh, for so um, now, now I want to discuss how you can possibly um, reduce as much as possible uh, this quantity. So the first thing you can change the temperature. You can decide to work at room temperature, and you have a uh, uh, noise corresponding to 300 Kelvin, but. You can go all the way down to uh, low temperature, lower and lower temperature using the different technologies. Um, in general, uh, as I said before, the lowest temperature you can achieve by, um, which you can use to cool macroscopic sample is something in the order of micro Kelvin. But it, it is not so easy to, to get there. I think that um, I will focus on this because uh, this is, I think, the lowest temperature you can achieve in a relatively straightforward way, uh, which is uh, through dilution refrigerator. And you can achieve temperature in the order of millikelvin, tens of millikelvin. Um, and okay, just to give an idea how it works, uh, dilution refrigerator is actually um, helium three, helium four dilution refrigerator is more or less like a conventional refrigerator, like you have at home, but uh, it's the fluid that flows in the, uh, in the circuit instead of being, uh, well, it's a special fluid, it's helium. 
actually is a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. And um, the phenomenon that is described is quite interesting. Is, uh, helium-3 and helium-4, when they cool to a very low temperature, they become quantum fluids, and they exploit the quantum macroscopic quantum coolant effect, um, and behave very in a very strange way. Um, in this case, um, what you exploit is that uh, they form two phases. Uh, one is very rich of helium-3, and one is very diluted. And these phases, you have a phase separation somewhere in the, in the coldest part here. The fluid that flows in this way during the coldest part. And here you have, uh, you force the system to flow from the rich phase to the helium-3 to flow from the rich phase to the diluted phase, which is somehow equivalent uh, to uh, the conventional fluid uh, flowing from liquid to vapor phase. And this uh, involves an, an absorption of entropy, which uh, relates to cooling. So the system, uh, the fluid by uh, circulating here absorbs a power here. And it turns out that the, this mechanism is very efficient uh, in the range uh, from 10 millikelvin up to almost 1 kelvin. And the cooling power is quite high, so uh, you can actually uh, operate very large systems um, and cool your experiment here in this uh, range. This is a standard way now, nowadays to do experiment in the um, types of experiment, in particular superconducting qubits, uh, uh, or also devices to measure, uh, radiation sensors to measure the cosmic microwave background. So you are building telescopes in which they cool the sensor through this kind of machine. But you can do a lot of uh, different experiments here at low temperature. Um, okay, now um, so this was the temperature. The other important parameters, which is much more difficult to, to tune because it's much more difficult to predict is the dissipation, the quality factor. Um, so um, what do you have to do if you want to, to set up an experiment with the highest possible quality factor and so to reduce the, the thermal noise as much as you can? Uh, so um, in general, this is quite complicated because you have a lot of possible sources of dissipation in mechanical systems. Um, for instance, well, you have uh, volume dissipation. So you have some dissipation which is due to you know, something that happens inside the, the, your system. So whenever you have an oscillation of a mechanical resonator, you have some elastic energy which is stored in the system. For instance, at a cantilever, a cantilever vibrating, uh, there is some stress, internal stress. Uh, and the, the system actually is storing potential elast elastic potential energy inside. And this leads to dissipation um, because of many possible mechanisms like thermoelastic dissipation. Uh, it, there are a lot of complicated uh, mechanisms which lead to um, dissipation. Um, but uh, in general, you have a problem. The, the quality factor is much worse than that determined by this effect because for instance, surface dissipation can be dominating. Uh, surface, usually, if you think, um, surface is, is much dirtier than the bulk in, uh, in general in any, in any sample because you have uh, many more defects. Uh, you have uh, you can have uh, uh, oxide layers. Uh, you can have uh, uh, absorption of uh, some uh, particles uh, um, on the surface. And all these things leads to dissipation. Um, then you can have clamping losses. So any mechanical system that is coupled to, suspended to uh, some point, that there is some kind of leakage of energy into the substrate. And then uh, you have, uh, well, gas losses, of course, are also important, but um, um, well, this, in principle, you can reduce as much as you want just by doing very good vacuum. So, um, this, yeah. 
Where did you see this? Ah, okay, uh, yes, this slide. <laughs> no, but, um, well, that I come, I will discuss now this. Um, so this is actually something similar was shown yesterday. Uh, this is just, I think, an uh, older one. It was uh, it, uh, 2005. I think this was uh, the first version of this plot. In which you see that the size, uh, increase the size, you, you, you increase the quality factor. But uh, this is actually uh, exactly the point I wanted to, to show here. I think it was a question yesterday, maybe it was you. Uh, well, all these systems are very different, so it's very difficult to, to do a really a comparison, but the trend is clear, and one possible explanation is, in fact, uh, surface dissipation, because if you increase the size of the system, the volume, well, um, what you find in this relation, actually, is that the quality factor grows roughly as the linear size. Uh, so the volume to the one-third, if you see, if you look at the orders of magnitude here and here. And you can think of this as the ratio of surface to volume. So if you do something that's very large, not the membrane, I agree, but in general, if you have something that's bigger, by picking the same aspect ratio, what you're doing is to uh, reduce the, the ratio of surface to volume. So you expect that if you increase the size of the system, you, what, you have larger quality factor. Or at least uh, it, it's very likely that, especially at the low, time, at the low size, uh, when you are in the nano, nanomechanical resonator, surface effects are actually very important. People have seen effects just by uh, treating in some way the, the surface with some process, by terminating the, the surface with some hydrogen or so, it, it can improve the quality. While in macroscopic system, you are very likely approaching the intrinsic uh, value that is determined by the bulk. In membranes, it's more complicated because you have other effects, and maybe I will discuss later. Um, so, um, well, now I'll discuss some, something very interesting. It's uh, um, um, a very well-known way, actually, in, especially in the... In the um, the field of gravitational detectors, they, um, no, this mechanism which is called dissipation dilution. The idea is that you can, uh, um, you have in nature uh, springs which are naturally lossless. And the simplest example is gravity. If you take a simple pendulum, it's a mechanical oscillator, which is uh, uh, where the, the restoring force is gravitational not due to elastic uh, uh, energy stored in some mechanical system. So in principle, a pendulum is lossless. Um, if, you, if you are in high vacuum, of course. In practice, uh, this is not the case because uh, uh, what people see is that um, well, the wire could connect the inertial mass to the point is not, uh, it's not an ide ideal wire. It will bend somewhere in here but this will be the shape. So it is true that the gravitational uh, spring is the, the, the largest effect, but you will always have some kind of elastic bending here, so you have some, also some dissipation. However, it turns out that uh, in practice, uh, the elastic energy stored here in this motion, is, in this uh, bending, is much smaller than the, uh, than the gravitational. So the dissipation is actually diluted. So the effective loss due to this effect is scales with the ratio of the, of the spring constant, actually. And this turns out to be very uh, much smaller than one. For instance, in LIGO, uh, they, um, the, the test masses of uh, the mirror of LIGO are suspended through, uh, essentially, through pendulum, complicated pendulum system, but essentially pendulum. Uh, and exploiting this effect, they can go from even though the, the material they use as a loss factor of uh, 10 to minus 6, this is the inverse of the quality factor of, due to the material. Uh, in practice, they get uh, something like 10 to minus 8. So the quality factor is order of 10 to the 8 of this uh, pendulum, which is enormous, enormous. Actually, I don't know if they really measure this, if they estimate, because 
you calculate the, the, term, the, the, the ring down time of this uh, uh, pendulum, it will be like uh, 10 to the 8 uh, at the frequency of less than 1 hertz. So it will be like uh, probably years or so. The time uh, it will take for this uh, to, to ring down. Another uh, possible way to uh, reduce the quality, to increase the quality factor is uh, this uh, by using optomechanical springs. Uh, this is an experiment they've done also in, uh, in MIT, in uh, LIGO, I think. Um, with, um, they have a mirror attached to a pendulum, it's the national mass of a pendulum, and the frequency is, uh, uh, well, it's a very floppy system, so it's 12 hertz of resonant frequency. Uh, this is inserted in an optical cavity, and when they store a high power here, you have a strong optomechanical spring. And uh, they can achieve a regime in which the spring is much larger than the mechanical spring. So uh, they, the frequency can go from 12 hertz up to one kilohertz, and the, the quality factor increases also by the same ratio, basically. Uh, so they can achieve easily one million even if the pendulum uh, is quite bad uh, in terms of quality factor. And uh, um, however, uh, the, it has to be noted that the damping ratio doesn't change. So the frequent, you increase the quality factor by increasing the frequency, but the ratio is the same. And in practice, uh, as you should have seen here, what really matters is the ratio between the frequency and the quality factor. If you want to achieve very low force noise, you want high Q, but uh, you want possibly to keep low frequency. And if you want this uh, low frequency, the need for low frequency is, uh, uh, you can find uh, from the beginning, because if you look at how the Cavendish experiment was uh, designed, they were exactly to have very low frequency. So they already found the right uh, lessity to achieve a very good uh, force sensitivity. Okay, this is another interesting uh, way that somehow uh, is similar to increase the quality factor. So this has been shown yesterday. Um, now it is a very uh, active, um, there are many groups that are trying to develop similar systems. These are membranes made of silicon nitride. And uh, uh, actually in this experiment they have uh, built uh, out of a membrane, this is the frame, uh, so there was a membrane here and they machined out the structure in which you have a central part, which is connected uh, through four legs uh, to the frame. And it's possible to fabricate this uh, stuff in such a way that the, the stress of this uh, uh, membrane and this, uh, these strings is very, uh, very high, actually close to the breaking limit uh, of, the, of the material. And uh, in this way, these, these strings behave basically as the strings of a guitar. If you increase the tension, increase the frequency. Uh, so the, the, the spring constant here is dominated by the tension effect, not by the bending uh, you have in a, you would have if the system was floppy. And in this way, it can probably the frequency of the system would be uh, without stress would be something like a kilohertz. And they, in this way, you can achieve high frequency like in the hundred uh, kilohertz. And they achieve a very, very high quality factor, like 10 to the 8 at room temperature, which is incredibly large. Um, however, uh, well, this is very good. Uh, that for quantum optomechanics, it's really good because in quantum optomechanics, uh, as you seen yesterday, you want to maximize the product frequency to, to maximize quantum effect. However, it turns out that if you want to measure a force, what, met, what, what really matters is the ratio between the two. And, uh, also, this is something similar to, to, to this situation. You increase the frequency and the quality factor at the same time, but uh, this doesn't uh, improve uh, for force detection. Although this is a very good system by itself, because uh, 10 to the 8 at room temperature, this is relatively low frequency, so this is a very good system to measure forces. Okay, I will not discuss this, but uh, you can think of levitation 
discussed yesterday and uh, today also. Uh, this is essentially total dilution. You have removed completely the elastic part of the dissipation, of the spin constant. You have only a particle uh, which only the center of mass moves uh, inside an externally applied potential, which can be completely lost. Uh, if, uh, op if you have an optical um, spring, uh, then it should be lost. Uh. And in principle, these systems are uh, limited only, uh, the dissipation are limited only by the gas, uh, the residual gas that is inside the, the vacuum chamber. And you can easily achieve, uh, well, I think 10 to the 8, uh, but uh, in principle, if you remove completely the, the gas, it should be possible to achieve much larger, much larger speed. Um, Okay, just to be complete, also, this is not an interesting topic, clamping losses. Clamping losses are, um, you, uh, let's take a cantilever. A cantilever is attached to some uh, support, to some frame. And uh, when this cantilever oscillates, you have some stress, which is, the maximum of stress is actually the base of the, of the cantilever. It is called intuitive. Because of this stress, you have some um, energy, which actually, some tonnes which are uh, released in, into the substrate. So you have really, really energy which leaks out, and this is uh, uh, limiting the, the quality factor. Uh, because it's a mechanism through which your system uh, uh, loses energy towards the, uh, the outside. Uh, this problem has been uh, um, solved uh, possible to solve this almost completely by properly designing the mechanical system. The most known, um, well-known solution is this one. Um, it's called the double paddle torsional resonator. It's uh, a torsional resonator in which you have, so this is the substrate to which the system is attached through this leg. And then you have these two uh, wings that uh, oscillates in counter phase the anti-symmetric mode. And also there is a, a small piece here that rotates uh, in proper way. In such way, in this oscillating mode, the, uh, the leg here is completely, uh, uh, it doesn't move at all. It's completely uh, quiet. And in this way, you remove completely the, uh, so that there is no energy that flows from the mechanical oscillation into the substrate. So by, by doing the, just this clever design, you, you can really completely uh, remove clamping glasses. And this system has been used actually to, to measure the intrinsic uh, dissipation of materials. Uh, because you know that you can reduce completely this effect. So people have actually been able to also to build cantilevers which, uh, in which uh, this, uh, through similar uh, effect, it's possible to avoid the leakage of energy to the, um, to the outside. In this way, you can reduce the clamping losses to a level which allow quality factor to be larger than the quality <clears throat> um, Okay, um, I, was to, I want also to just mention the, uh, this other problem. What, what happens when you change the temperature? In general, uh, the, um, the dissipation, the trend is uh, to, um, it decreases with temperature, the quality factor increases when you reduce the temperature. Uh, in a very complicated way because there are many mechanisms which affect the dissipation like the elastic noise, uh, the by peaks and something like that. So you reduce temperature and the quality factor actually has some minimum maximum. Uh, what happens in very interesting is that very low temperature, when you have a temperature below one Kelvin, you have a nice effect that um, the, the dissipation of the system becomes dominated by, um, especially in amorphous material, by so-called two-level system. What are two-level system? Uh, people think, well, two-level system there is a, a general theory that has been introduced already in the 70s by Anderson and others. It uh, explains uh, almost uh, perfectly all the 
phenomenological um, phenomenology of uh, glasses at low temperature. So all macroscopic features of uh, uh, quantities like thermal conductivity or its capacity and so on, including mechanical dissipation are well explained by this model. And essentially the model is that in, uh, um, in a glass you have uh, that the atoms can tunnel between different configurations. They can have local excitation, which are not phonons, not propagating waves, but they are localized, uh, in which the potential energy looks like this, like a qubit, basically. Uh, and at a sufficiently low temperature, you have, uh, that you have quantum tunneling between the two uh, wells. If you have a collection of this uh, uh, two-level system, with a broad uh, range of parameters, what you get is exactly what you see in the, in the experiment. And what you see is uh, this uh, very interesting from the practical point of view situation, which uh, this is the dissipation, so the inverse of the Q, and this is the temperature. This is an experiment in which they used uh, actually this, this I show before, the torsion of oscillator. And they, they measure, the quality factor is basically saturated. So you, you are at a few Kelvin and it's constant, it's constant, it's constant. You don't expect anything else to happen anymore. And all of a sudden you go below one Kelvin and start dropping. And it really, the effect is really dramatic. In glasses it can go down by orders of magnitude. If you really reach something like 10 to the, well, this is the scale is 10 to minus four. So this is order of 10 to the seven. You improve by three or four orders of magnitude. Uh, well, this, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly. This slide, ah, yeah, yeah, this is a, uh, okay, this was an example, but uh, you have, okay, this is silicon side, this is a different, um, it's just glass. <laughs> So it's a very bad material at high temperature. If you go at very low temperature, it becomes all of a sudden a very good material. And actually, I've, I've also seen this effect in crystals. This was a surprise for me, but um, this is a cantilever. Um, I will show tomorrow some measurement with this system, but um, because in fact, this, uh, um, I measured the dissipation of the system, which is order of one million. The quality factor is one million or less. It's 10 to minus, it is the inverse of the Q, so 10 to minus six. And again, when I go below one Kelvin, the dissipation starts, drops. And I can achieve something like 10 to minus seven here. And uh, um, this is a crystal, but uh, uh, if you have just a few, one or two nanometers of oxide, which is amorphous in the layer, uh, just uh, by comparing with this experiment, you, you will be able to explain uh, what is uh, uh, this effect. The frequency. Uh, the frequency changes also, but it's a very small effect. Well, at the level of the Q, so it's something like uh, 10 to minus uh, 6 uh, or so, in this case. And uh, that's also a characteristic, uh, well, uh, you can, the model predicts also a change in the frequency, which is very strange uh, behavior, like with the logarithm of uh, the temperature or so. And uh, it's possible to see both effects. So that this model is very, very general, and uh, it surprisingly fits uh, an enormous amount of uh, experiments. They have done a lot of experiments in this kind, actually. This is just an example, but people have done uh, any kind of amorphous materials uh, with different type of disorder also, and all of them found more or less the same features. Also with very similar parameters. So that's quite a universal, surprising universal uh, mechanism for all amorphous. Uh, you mean, 
you're asking where are these two level systems? Or? Yeah, because uh, yeah, you, this is a crystal, so you will not expect uh, this effect, but I, I expect that the surface of the, of the cantilever is uh, amorphous, at least on uh, one or two nanometers. So you would have a two-level system on the surface. Ah, you mean uh, a clamping loss? Uh, yeah, that, that um, actually, this is, for me, what's a surprise that you can achieve so high quality spectra with a simple cantilever. But uh, that's what I find. I don't have an explanation of the. Um, so I would expect that the clamping loss here would uh, limit the quality factor to some value higher than this. But this doesn't happen, so uh, I have not expl no explanation for that. But. Uh, Phenomenologically, this uh, behavior looks very similar to this, so I think, and also the frequency, as the, the question is, the frequency is changing in the same way as expected by the tunneling model. So I think this is the most likely explanation. I don't know if I uh, asked that. Ah, yeah, that, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can discuss uh, later because I have to think a bit of that. Yeah, here I was thinking really just at the material property. But, uh, uh, I don't know if there is a, a, another mechanism that can explain this. I just um, like to uh, summarize uh, what I said. So far, um, basically, well, things are quite complicated. As I think, there are many mechanisms which can lead to dissipation. In general, what to summarize the quality factor of typical nanomechanical systems is in the order of ten to four, ten to the six. Nanomechanical, also mechanical, macroscopic systems. Uh, but you can achieve something like 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. Uh, by proper optimization, you can, by taking good material, uh, lowering temperature, uh, removing clamping losses, and so on. And somehow, all this, uh, despite all this possible uh, way to improve. Uh, it seems that there is, uh, at the moment, uh, some sort of uh, higher value, the order of 10 to the 8, which is more or less the best you can achieve uh, nowadays. Uh, I think to go well beyond uh, this, uh, uh, this threshold, uh, you need to go to dedicated systems. Probably the only way, uh, because uh, uh, yeah, here we have a lot of uh, different effects. So if you want to really go to 10 to the 10 or so with the conventional resonator and you to optimize probably all of these parameters together. So that would be very difficult. Okay, now this was about the um, fighting the thermal noise, let's say. Uh, now I want to say something, uh, uh, yeah, time. Okay. about uh, the detector noise. Um, so the detector noise, is, uh, as I said, we have some imprecision and some back action. Uh, imprecision noise is the, what in the optomechanical system is the shock noise, so the, the noise that the system uh, adds to the um, measured signal. The back action is a force, the real force which drives the system. Um, there is a fundamental limit on this, uh, um, on the force and the displacement which is uh, noise, which is given by the, uh, well, essentially it's the Eisenberg microscope argument, which is, it's a traditional um, 
argument of, Mike, of Eisenberg is uh, uh, the measurement of the position and the momentum of the particle and electron, for instance, using the photon. And uh, as you know, if you increase the wavelength, the, the, the frequency of the phonon or the photon, you reduce the wavelength, then you can achieve a better resolution of position, but then you increase uh, by the same amount the, the uncertainty in the momentum. And it turns out that the product of the two is bounded by h bar, alpha h bar. And this is uh, actually, um, well, it's very general uh, limit. This is not actually the, due to the uncertainty relation uh, of the system. It's, it's due to the uncertainty, the, the zero point fluctuation actually of the apparatus, the measurement system, in this case, the photon. Um, if you translate this into uh, spectral densities, you have this uh, relation, this very general relation, which was uh, found, um, I think, uh, well, this is the first paper in which the, the thing was analyzed in detail, I think, by Caves uh, in the 80s, but I think the, this relation was found actually previously, people working in microwave uh, amplifiers and masers and and, um, well, th these are um, one side, the spectral density. You will find probably the same uh, relation with h bar squared divided by four. Then it's just uh, the definition of the spectral density. Uh, anything else? Uh, this relation holds uh, uh, as long as you have high power gain in your system. And so if you have a gain, you, ha you need to, um, to add uh, this noise the measurement to the product of the uh, spectral density, of course, in this case. And this can be achieved by an ideal quantum limited detector. Um, an example of uh, uh, ideal detector is uh, this, uh, uh, well, in theory, but also in practice, recently, this optomechanical sensing. In optomechanical sensing, you can really achieve the Heisenberg unit. Uh, so suppose that you have uh, the measure the position of a mirror, uh, the laser of units of photons, and uh, um, then the measurement, uh, what you do, you measure actually the phase of the reflected beam, which would be factor two k, x, k is the wave number of the photons. And uh, if you displace the, the mirror by x, you have twice the optical path, x, so two k, x. At the same time, uh, you have a back action, which is due to the fact that the, uh, each uh, of these photon will apply, upon reflection, will uh, exert a force uh, to uh, a momentum change to its bar shape. Okay. Um, now, if the photons are in a coherent state, then the arrival time of these photons is Poissonian, follow the Poisson statistic, which means that in a given time, you have a fluctuation of the the number of these photons, which is proportional to the square root of A. This leads to a fluctuation in the, in the radiation, in the force, so the radiation pressure force, which is equal to square root of N times this quantity. Um, at the same time, uh, you have the, if you have a coherent state, you have this relation between the, the number and the phase uncertainty. Uh, uh, through this relation, you can calculate your phase, uh, your phase noise. And then if you combine this with this, you get exactly the Eisenberg uh, relation, which we know that's the equivalent to this. Um, so the fact that you have a radiation pressure is related actually with the fact that you have Poisson statistics. If you had uh, photons that arrive uh, exactly on, uh, at, the right, at equal intervals one to each other, you would have actually no fluctuations in the radiation pressure. So you have some, this would be some squeeze of the state. Um, but in literature, you can find uh, the, another thing that is called standard quantum limit. Uh, standard quantum limit is, uh, by, by definition, by just by the, the name, is not something fundamental because uh, it will not be called standard. So why, uh, what is standard quantum limit? Um, people have introduced this to, 
to state the fact that if you measure, um, for instance, the displacement, you want to measure the, the position of a mechanical system, <coughs> then um, you will have this same precision noise that is the measurement adds to the, to the signal, but you have also the back action, which uh, produces a displacement noise to the mechanical response of the system. Here we assume that thermal noise is completely achieved, okay? And this is the total uh, displacement noise. Um, now, you can uh, optimize the, you can play with these two quantities just by changing the power in the system because the, 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 the force noise is proportional to the power, uh, while the imprecision noise is inversely proportional to the, uh, well, this is a of physics, of course, one over power. <laughs> um, so that uh, uh, the product is the same, but uh, you can uh, balance these two terms. And it turns out that the best you can do to minimize this quantity is when these two terms are equal. And this minimization uh, leads to uh, this expression. Uh, uh, it says that the, the total noise uh, is bounded by this quantity. It's bar, and then you have the, the associativity of the system. Uh, this is called standard quantum limit. Uh, we will see later why. You can do for the displacement. Um, you can do the same argument, basically uh, completely specular to the force. But you want to measure the force, then well, you assume that uh, you, uh, again, the thermal noise is completely killed. So you have only the back action of the, uh, of the measurement system. But it will, you will have also the displacement noise, which uh, provides which gives an equivalent force by here by dividing by the, by the suitability. So you convert the, 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 the displacement into force. And you have again two terms as here. And again, you can optimize this and you'll find that the force, the minimum force you can measure is given by this expression. And again, you have X bar now, the suitability is uh, in the denominator. So what this expression tells us uh, is that, uh, uh, again, uh, as in the thermal noise consideration before, uh, if you want to measure a very small force, you want something that is, you want this to be very high. This high means you want something that uh, is, a very, is very floppy. You, with a very high associativity means that you apply the force and you have a large uh, that's what, how you can get a quantum limited, uh, a standard quantum limited force as low as possible. Uh, here you have the opposite. Uh, if you want to measure a small displacement, uh, you want something that is very rigid. That with the, this number is, this must be very low. Uh, so uh, this, this is what happens in gravitational wave detectors. In gravitational wave detectors, they want to have something that uh, uh, more rigid as possible with a large bar. So in fact, uh, in uh, the evolution, for instance, in the interferometric detectors, the gravitational wave, they are uh, going towards larger and larger masses. Now they are, the best masses are something like 30 kilograms or so. Um, while uh, the previous, in the initial LIGO, it was much uh, smaller, well, order of kilograms. This one? Uh, this is the Heisenberg uh, limit that I, that I uh, showed before. This is the equivalent to the, to this essentially, uh, for the special bar. So I, I, it's easy to do a very simple example, numerical example of, in the case of LIGO, you have, uh, um, you can try to estimate what is the, the sensitivity of LIGO, assuming that it's close to the quantum limit, which is actually the case. Uh, LIGO is basically an interferometer, uh, Michelson interferometer with, where the two arms are two cavities. And the, uh, uh, the mirrors, the hand mirrors of these cavities are very um, massive objects. Uh, with, uh, 
40 kilograms uh, mirrors. And uh, well, if you just uh, take, these are in, um, essentially in the free mass limit. So these masses are suspended by pendulum. Um, so these are actually mechanical resonators, but the observation frequency of LIGO is much higher than the resonance frequency. So uh, even if you have some resonant term uh, in the, the response of the system, um, you are in the limit in which the frequency is much higher than resonance frequency. So you are basically in the limit in which the susceptibility is this, which is essentially the free mass uh, limit of the susceptibility. If you have a free mass in space, then it will respond to a force you built uh, around. So if you just plug this into this uh, expression for the quantum limit, you get the expression. And uh, if you plug the number, the real number in LIGO, uh, now the minimum noise is something like uh, uh, 100 hertz. Uh, or so, and uh, the mass, the mass of each mass, uh, of each test mass is four, uh, 40 kilos. I think I used 10 kilos here before. Uh, probably you have to use the, the reduced mass for this calculation, but, uh, well, the order of magnitude is this. Um, maybe I can show you the spectrum. I have some slides. This is actually the, the power spectrum of advanced LIGO. Uh, maybe now it's a bit better, but this was at the time of the detection of the first gravitational wave, or something like that. And uh, it's a very broad spectrum. Uh, with the minimum is here. And at the minimum, so here the system is dominated by shock noise, I think. And uh, here uh, you are with the thermal noise and seismic noise. But LIGO is actually in the limit in which the, the back action is, uh, is not dominant, but it's close to be, uh, uh, so they plan to achieve a limit in which the back action is significant. So it means that uh, at this level, we are not at the standard quantum limit, but uh, close to. And it is at 10 to minus 23, uh, in, uh, the unit of strain, which is um, one over square root of F. Um, okay, go back. But you can guess this number uh, very easily just by using the formula I show uh, before. Um, just assuming that the, uh, we are at the standard quantum limit just plugging in the number in the formula, you get something like 10 to minus 20 meters per square root of F in terms of displacement. And since the length of the arm is uh, some kilometers, you have to divide by three orders of magnitude to get, uh, what happens here? I don't know. <laughs> here there is a one, okay. Um, what you get is a, a strain noise, it's exactly 10 to minus 23, well, exactly. More or less 10 to minus 23, which is the best you can do with something like LIGO, at the standard quantum limit, if you want to reduce this, this noise uh, by working at the standard quantum limit, actually you have to increase this mass. So they would need to go to like a mirror with one ton of, uh, of mass. It's not what they want to do. I think they, they are actually trying to overcome the, the standard quantum limit. Which is actually the, um, I think I want to briefly discuss. Uh, um, standard quantum limit is, uh, of course, is not a fundamental limit. This question, the answer to this question is obvious because, not because the, it's called standard quantum limit, otherwise it would not be called standard. The thing is, well, this limit is fundamental because it's 
that the Heisenberg uh, relation. But the, this relation doesn't uh, forbid, in principle, to get arbitrary large accuracy on a continuous measurement of a variable, um, provided that you completely give up information about the candidate. Um, this was recognized a uh, um, long time ago, actually, by first by Braginsky, uh, by other people working in the field of gravitational wave detection. This, I think, is the first paper where this thing was uh, discussed in detail. And uh, here it is stated clearly that there is uh, no quantum limit if you want to detect a classical force uh, uh, with a quantum oscillator. So if you are using a mechanical system to measure, just measure a classical force, uh, there is no limit. Uh, uh, in this case, gravitational wave, some think of gravitational wave as a classical effect. Um, and they uh, demonstrated this uh, on paper, and later people found uh, uh, schemes that actually are able to do that. The key is uh, that this measurement called quantum demolition measurement. And the key idea is that so the fundamental uh, requirement of the quantum demolition is that the, the, you have to divide, devise a measurement apparatus which measure, which is, so your measurement device has to be coupled to a variable of the system, X, which uh, commutes with the uh, Hamiltonian of the free particle for the two systems. Um, this is unfortunately not the case for the position. Most uh, measurement uh, devices are measuring just the position of the system. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, obviously, this doesn't hold because H, uh, the commutator of H uh, and X is equal to zero, even for a free particle. And uh, the thing is that um, um, so the physical picture if you want is this, that if you measure the position of uh, uh, system, this will be still perturb the, the, the momentum, it will increase the uncertainty of the momentum, and this will influence the next measurement of the position. So if you change the uncertainty of the momentum, it will change the, the, the position after uh, time tau. Um, but surprisingly, at least, um, this doesn't happen for the, if you do other way around. If you measure, if your measurement apparatus is designed to measure the momentum, instead of the position, then this doesn't happen because, uh, uh, well, in this case, HP is equal to zero for a free particle, take a free particle, uh, because if you measure the momentum, this will influence, will perturb the, uh, the position uncertainty, but this uh, that will not influence the next measurement of momentum. If you think uh, about this, this is uh, clear. Because uh, changing the position doesn't change the, uh, the momentum. And um, well, actually, this, uh, in this paper, I think they even devise a, an experimental scheme which can measure the momentum without measuring the position, which is uh, quite complicated. But what the people have done in practice is uh, to devise quantum demolition measurement of a mechanical system. Or mechanical resonator, not a free particle. Um, I think something was shown also yesterday, uh, but this is what is called a two pump uh, uh, mechanical setup. In which, well, here I, this is a very general scheme which sort of opto mechanical setup in which instead of a yeah, mechanical resonator, which changes the capacitance of the LC resonator, you can think this as an optical cavity if you want, but. Uh, in which the, the motion of the system changes the length of the cavity. This is the same, and uh, this is more similar to what happens in what is called microwave automechanical systems, in which the mechanical system is coupled to a microwave uh, uh, resonator. So in some cases, it's really like LSC resonator. You drive this uh, electrical system, and when uh, the position changes, you have uh, the change in the amplitude of phase in the output. Um, so the behavior of the system be depends on the, uh, how you drive this uh, cavity. So normally you drive with uh, one single 
sinusoidal signal, uh, and this behaves essentially like a, a parametric converter of phonon into photons. In this way, you measure the, photon, the, the mechanical state. Um, to perform a, quen, a quantum non demolition measurement, um, you have to do this kind of uh, things. You have to apply a double pump in which um, the frequencies are actually the sum of the difference and the difference of the electrical and the mechanical system. This is actually, uh, it's possible to show this is the only possible way to do linear uh, measurement, of quantum D measurement. And how does it work? Well, essentially, Um, this pump uh, is nothing else than this, if you play with the transistor. Yeah. Exactly, yes. This, if you have two pumps with the same amplitude, it's like uh, having a carrier uh, at the frequency of the microwave. So this high, highly oscillating, high frequency oscillation, modulated by the frequency of the mechanical system. And if you write uh, uh, the... Um, Hamiltonian in terms of the um, the quadratures. Um, so the quadrature of a mechanical system and the electrical system can be very defined as uh, by moving to a rotating frame. And so you can define the cosine and sine components of uh, the, the system. So these are slowly changing uh, variables because the fast changing the rotating uh, uh, Part is contained in this, uh, uh, these terms. If you do that and you write down the equations, well, this is very simplified uh, treatment. I just want to give a very rough idea because that's the maximum I can do, actually. It's not something I am expert. Uh, but uh, um, what happens is that in absence of noise, you get these equations for the quadrature. You can think of these as a classical variable or operators, but the, the important point is that. Um, just look at this equation. It seems that the x1 quadrature here is coupled uh, to the q2 quadrature. So it determines the dynamics of the q2 quadrature. Uh, but at the same time, this quadrature is not uh, influenced by the electrical system. So what does it mean? Uh, at the same time, the, uh, the x2 quadrature, the conjugate quadrature, is uh, is not measured because it doesn't appear in the uh, here in the terms of uh, the derivative of the q but quadrature but you see uh, that there is a back action of the electrical system on the mechanical on this uh, mechanical quadrature. So basically what happens is that uh, you, you measure a quadrature and you dump all the back action on the other quadrature. So if you are able to construct uh, such kind of measurement in which you ask information only on one of the quadrature and you don't care about the other quadrature, then you can overcome the uh, limitation of the, um, the quantum limit because then now you have no back action here on this quadrature. So if you measure a force which uh, an external force which will couple to both quadrature, but you measure only this, so you want information only from this quadrature, then you don't have back action. So you can, uh, in principle, you can get arbitrarily large uh, accuracy. Just increase the power in the system, and you can get this. Uh, in a sense, uh, you are, uh, well, this is just a, a measurement but uh, with sim with just with changing a bit uh, the, the parameters of this pumping, uh, this uh, pump, you can also achieve, uh, uh, as, uh, yesterday you have seen uh, like this so mechanical cooling where you can cool one uh, mechanical system. If you do a tw a two pumps, you can, they can do also squeezing actually. Uh, um, so you can, cool in different way the two quadratures. And in particular, uh, well, I can show that just, this is just an example of uh, measurement in which they have 
demonstrated this uh, um, technique, uh, and it, it is called Bacaction Evading. This is the um, literature name of this scheme. Uh, it was actually, um, there was already in the 90s, uh, the mechanism has been demonstrated, but very far from the quantum limit, just on a classical level. It was demonstrated that it's possible to beat the standard, uh, uh, standard measurement uh, resolution. And here they have done it at very close to the quantum level. Now they have, there are some experiments that have done really quantum demolition measurement. Here what you see is that, well, the system is a microwave of the mechanical setup in which you have a mechanical system coupled to a microwave cavity, well, it doesn't matter the details. Um, they apply two pumps, two pump or one single pump, and you can see that with a single pump they get a limitation, a saturation in the resolution of the measurement, while with the, the Two pumps, so the, the function evading method, you, you can overcome this limit, the limit which is imposed by the standard um, relation. And nowadays, uh, uh, yeah, uh, applying similar variation of this scheme, they have achieved uh, using the similar setup of microwave automechanics, they have achieved uh, sing squeezing of a single quadrature below the quantum, quantum noise. the end actually because this the initial uh, beginning of the next uh, section um, which I will talk uh, tomorrow and tomorrow I will uh, uh, go more into the details of some experiments which are used to uh, test collapse models in uh, uh, using mechanical systems so this well in particular we focus on this nanomechanical system with, uh, with detecting spins and uh, on gravitational wave detection any questions? Thank you. If you have questions. If there is no more questions, let's thank the speaker. Thank you, sir.